is very much depends how you define humanism, how you define anthropocentrism. To me, um, it is not so much a rejection of that, it's a recognition that that specific mindset is a mindset that doesn't help us right here, right now. Uh, I'll give you another example. For instance, uh, um, I think of my grandmother. She was born uh, uh, in a peasant Italy, agricultural Italy, in, a, in, you know, like in, a, in, a, in an area that was, you know, they would wake up four in the morning, work all day long, and, uh, and her life was, she lived through two world wars, and uh, her life was pretty intense. And, uh, and so to her, uh, you know, the idea of uh, being in a city and being able to go to a supermarket and buy some flavorless pasta, she was so happy about it that she didn't have to make the pasta. Of course, they would be better, much more delicious, but she was so much done to, you know, in, in working so much. And so to me, for instance, the idea of like, you know, going and being able to have access to all this food, it is on level a luxury. It is also something that I grew up with, so I'm used to that. So I also feel that, you know, sometimes, if you think about these buildings right now, we didn't build these buildings. They are a vision of the past. I'm not saying that they are not beautiful or beautiful. I'm not judging these buildings. But I'm saying that the buildings in which we find ourselves were built by someone who is no longer here. They're probably long deceased. So we often find ourselves in the dreams of others, or things of one in a family where the parents are really pushing them to do something. And maybe they will do it just because the parents expect them to do. But then when they're 14 years old, they say, oh, wait a second, that was not my dream. And maybe they reinvent themselves and a whole reevaluation of values. So I would say that humanism and anthropocentrism are, to me, a dream of the past. I understand the dream. I understand that maybe it's still valuable for some communities around. But it's also a kind of new dream in the history of humankind. And it's also a dream that I think is actually, instead of helping us at this point, is actually killing us. Because if we keep thinking of us as in this hierarchy, in separation from everything else, it is literally the cause that is actually killing most humans at the moment, which is anthropogenic uh, reasons. So I would say that um, it's always good, uh, you know, I used to believe in revolutions when I was younger. I don't believe that in so much, I believe in evil evolutions, when something is ready and just naturally shift and change. And so I was, okay, natural culturally shift and change. We are in a post humanist community. So I would say that uh, it's, uh, it's not a rejection, it is to me a uh, natural, cultural, natural evolution of humanism. So I see posthumanism not as rejecting humanism or anthropocentrism, but it's almost like the next generation uh, that come out of that, but can no longer recognize themselves in those hierarchical frames. You know, and then on the other side is also, well, how do you define humanism and anthropocentrism? One more thing, if I can add in the last thing, is you know, some people say, well, there is no way you can understand yourself apart from being human. I hear that a lot. It's like, well, yeah, forget about anthropocentrism, forget about humanism, but what about your body? What about the way you perceive reality? What about your senses? I understand that, but I also, for instance, give you another example of, for instance, native epistemologies, for, inter for instance, I'm thinking of uh, from the Andes, or, for instance, from Brazil, Eduardo Rivera de Castro, and he studied a lot of uh, native uh, Amerindian cosmologies. And he brings the, the example of the shaman in this tradition. And the shaman is the being who is trans-species, because the shaman never forgot that they're not just an, uh, a, a biological body. And it's almost like, let me give you the example. If you think of all of this right now as one body, with a lot of eyes, the eyes, I think, are very easy because since we're very young, we, we learn to recognize others through the eyes. Let's bring the eyes, but it doesn't have to be the eyes, obviously. You know, a book doesn't have eyes in the same human sense. But if you think of this, let's actually do the experiment right now. They think of this, everything around, the, the, the technology, the, the roof, uh, all the biological beings, the food, everything is one body. It's almost like they say that you, your body with all your bacteria. This is one body. And now if you look around, and everywhere you see, it's a perspective coming through. Like, your, you know, all these eyes are a perspective of this one body. Now you realize that you are not, you are not uh, defined and you are not limited or limiting yourself to your biological borders. Also, where do I end? Do I end, you know, with the scarf or with my skin or to the air that I name? Where do I end? Um, so I like very much the notion of the shaman because the shaman is the one who never forgot that, he, that you're going beyond the species. That, you know, like a plant, you can communicate to a plant, to, to, to any other beings, because awareness is everywhere. 
And one more thing on this is that in these traditions, the human, so for instance, in shamanistic traditions, the human is not a species like us. Is the perspective of the subject. So in fact, for instance, this bottle, you could define this bottle as human if you perceive that there is awareness coming from this center of existence right now. Or if it's easier to think of, of a, they think of biological beings, sometimes it's easier of a bird. So that would be the human because for the bird, the bird has a bird culture. The, the bird look at the, at the worm and think, mm, that's wonderful, if you like chocolate, like it's chocolate, they start to get really, like, the, 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 oh, it's so good, the smell of a worm, so good. For us, for some of us, maybe it's chocolate, oh, chocolate or whatever, mm, whatever you like to eat. So the, the human, in these other traditions, is not a biological species, but is the center of awareness, is the subject. And there is no, in this tradition, the subject is not separated from the object, there is no object, there are only perspectives from mm -hmm. everywhere. So it is a very interesting question, and I do uh, uh, respect and also love, uh, love Kelly, I've known him for, that, for many years, he wrote uh, What is Posthumanism, if you want the reference of the book, back in 2009, so it was one of the pivotal texts of defining posthuman theory, posthumanist theory. And I would say, so to, to add to what he said, is, uh, yeah, it depends how you define them, and it's definitely not a rejection. I see more posthumanism as a philosophy of mediation than just a rejection. You can never reject something. How can you create this separation? There is never a complete separation. Otherwise, you go into the dichotomy. So uh, I hope I answered your question. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, I would say that's all. Thank you, Dr. Ferrando, for your lecture, and thank you, everyone, to uh, be here. Oh. Now, if you want, uh, feel free to go to the buffet and uh, eat and drink what you want. Thank you, Daniela. <laughs>